Hey guys, it's Yanni Umedish and in this video I am going to be talking about enzyme regulation. Now in my last video we looked at enzymes and their general properties and functions but in this video we're going to be looking at how they are regulated or controlled. Because we said that enzymes can speed reactions up to 1 billion times faster. <laughs> well, we know they're fast and the point is that at some point the body no longer needs these products and if it can't stop it then it leads to a waste of energy and resources basically and sometimes it can be fatal. And vice versa, the body also needs to be able to activate enzymes that are inactive when it needs to make the products. So all of these fall under enzyme regulation and we're also going to look at some practical applications of regulation of enzymes, especially in medicine. So strapping guys, this will be fun. So like I said in the last video, enzyme regulation can be in two ways. It could be to increase the activity of the enzyme where it's called enzyme activation or it could be to reduce it and there it's called enzyme inhibition. And just by the way, there is also enzyme induction and repression, but these ones are like majorly in, found in bacteria more than in humans, naturally. But just for our information, <laughs> enzyme induction happens when an organism encounters a stimulus and it reacts by producing more of an enzyme. So it is not a case of increasing catalytic activity, it's more like increasing the number of enzymes. And then repression is obviously the opposite. Repression is a decrease in the number of enzymes after the stimulus has gone or decreased. Now, as I was saying before I got sidetracked, <laughs> there are a bunch of ways that enzymes can be regulated. The first is competitive inhibition. And just like it sounds, it happens when two different molecules are trying to bind to the same enzyme at the same place, which is called the active site. And just because I'm the single girl that can only think of relationship examples, <laughs> here it goes. So we have a dude that is chasing a girl, he's making headway, things are going swell, and then all of a sudden, bam, there's another dude that looks almost exactly like him, same car and everything. <laughs> and the girl's like, uh, okay, I think I'm gonna like this dude a little bit better. And then our first dude is left in the lurch, basically drowning his service in a can of soda. So it is exactly like that, that is how competitive inhibitors work. They bind to the enzyme instead of the substrate. So our first trait, uh, <laughs> so our substrate, the first guy, decides to try his luck elsewhere and he might either win or lose, so that's the point. Like he is not the only person that is chasing the girl anymore, there are at least two different types of them. So now it's like he has like a one in two chance. But an easy way to counter this would be by increasing substrate concentration and then once again our substrate affinity will increase. So if you're in this situation, don't give up guys, you never know. <laughs> but I did not say it, okay, it wasn't me. So the another type is non-competitive regulation and I say regulation here because it can either be inhibitory or stimulatory for the substrate binding. So these types, we call them non-competitive because they bind to the allosteric sites, they don't bind to the active site like competitive enzymes, I mean like competitive inhibitors. So basically the other dude looks nothing like the first dude, okay, he's like the complete opposite and he could either help the first dude or kick him to the curb. Like the other dude friend zones the girl and then he's like hey this dude really likes you okay go for it and then he pushes the girl to the substrate so what we're saying now is that stimulatory regulators they increase the enzymes affinity for the substrate while inhibitory regulation regulators are like the complete opposite like need i say more <laughs> so the next type we have is uncompetitive or anti-competitive inhibition in this case, the inhibitor only binds to the enzyme substrate complex because we know when an enzyme is trying to react with a substrate, at first we have the enzyme and the substrate and then they bind to form a temporary enzyme substrate complex and then they form the enzyme and the product. So here, yeah, this dude is totally ridiculous. I mean, what the? <laughs> He doesn't bind to the enzyme when she's single. Oh no, he waits until they get engaged first and then he starts to shoot his shot. Like totally ridiculous, unacceptable. But yes, it is what it is. So yeah, the uncompetitive inhibitors only bind to the enzyme substrate complex. I know, yuck. 
and then the next one is the mixed inhibitor and this one could either bind to the enzyme substrate complex or to the enzyme itself it has it doesn't care basically and is obviously just as ridiculous as the uncompetitive guy but oh well and then in all the types of inhibitions that i have talked about so far they are actually reversible meaning sometimes the girl can come to her senses <laughs> and go back to her first love or she might not anyone but the point is that there is a possibility that the enzyme will lose the inhibitor and then it will get to react with the substrate but this type now this irreversible type inhibition it's also called suicide inhibition basically the inhibitor binds covalently to the active site and like it doesn't ever like leave the enzyme ever ever <laughs> so here they form a substrate analog like basically they look almost identical to the actual substrates and then they bind to the enzyme and they never let go and an important example of this is sarin which is a nerve gas and it's like it's a really painful way to kill a person okay it's evil but there are also some good applications of this irreversible type and that we can see in aspirin which binds to psychooxygenase Next, we have regulatory enzymes. These ones don't really exactly fit into competitive or non-competitive or whatever it is we've been talking about since. Regulatory enzymes, we have them when we have like a multi-enzyme metabolic sequence, sort of like the Krebs cycle or glycolysis, where we have like so many enzymes, so many steps to get a final product. So the regulatory enzyme is usually the very first enzyme of this reaction or chain of reactions. And there are two things that could happen and the first is feedback inhibition and here the regulatory enzyme is inhibited by the end product of the pathway when the concentration is higher than normal so basically our final product acts as the backstabbing friend <laughs> that stops the regulatory enzyme from making any more intermediates that finally lead to the product and then the second one is feedback regulation and this one, the end product ain't gonna chill, okay? It goes straight to the source. The end product here decreases the rate of the synthesis of this enzyme at the level of gene expression. Like, seriously, it's totally vexing. <laughs> okay, so now that we've looked at all these types of enzyme regulations, on this page, we can see the examples that I promised. So you guys can pause to meditate on them and everything. <laughs> So next, under enzyme regulation, we have covalent modification of enzymes after biosynthesis. And some of these modifications could be phosphorylation. Phosphorylation is like the most common, like it's totally common. And it is catalyzed by enzyme kinase, by the way. There is also adenylation, methylation, or dysphosphorylation. And all these modifications could either act to increase the enzyme activity or to decrease it. Also, let's look at what we call proteolytic activation of enzymes. So basically here we have enzymes that are not produced as mature forms, if we call it that. They are produced as inactive forms. These inactive forms are also called zymogenes or proenzymes. So they are like the baby enzymes. They, uh, they have potential but they can't yet function as actual enzymes. So for them to work, they have to be activated by proteolytic cleavage. Cleavage, sort of breaking of a bond, it's like the active site was originally covered and so this cleavage is just to expose the active site. And an example of this is in the conversion of trypsinogen to trypsin. And yes, this activation is usually irreversible. And lastly, let's look at isoenzymes. Isoenzymes are enzymes with different amino acid sequences but they act on the same substrates. So basically, a good use of this is allowing the cell to catalyze the same reaction under different conditions. An example of an isoenzyme is the mammalian lactate dehydrogenase. So applications of these enzymes in medicine, well, based on the examples I had given, we could already see some applications there basically, like in making of all these pharmaceutical drugs that act on these enzymes and all. So a couple of more examples is in alu, 
Mm, okay, let me try that again. <laughs> it's in allopurinol, used in cancer therapy, and also disulfiram, used in alcoholism. Those are some really prominent examples, so that's why I mentioned them separately. So guys, we're done with enzyme inhibition, regulation, uh, activation, repression, induction. I know, such mouthful. So yes, we're finally done. Thanks for watching, guys.